You may be seated. If you will turn in your Bibles to the 12th chapter, the Gospel of Luke, beginning in verse 41, as we continue our study through the Word. Now, you will remember that Jesus is headed towards the cross. He is preparing his heart. He's preparing the disciples. And we see that he is now reminding the people, instructing them, of the importance now of being ready, of taking and making sure that our hearts are, are solidly toward God. And, and what does that mean? How can we do that? Well, the first thing that Jesus was talking about was hypocrisy, making sure that we just are authentically connected to God and authentically connected to one another, that that's God's desire for you, that you don't need to pretend that you're more than you are. God loves you just the way that, that you are, and the Holy Spirit is doing a great work in your life. And so be authentic, be real, be who you are. Secondly, we saw that he was telling us not to worry, not to be fearful, not not to be anxious and to be able to profess Christ as our Lord and Savior. Jesus said that if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my heavenly Father. But if you deny me before men, I will also deny you before my heavenly Father. And so being willing to share and being willing to uh, witness. Uh, he said that we were not to be greedy, but that we're to be generous. And you remember that he gave the parable of, uh, of the person who just focused on wealth in this life and the temporal things. And boy, did he accomplish. Accumulated tremendous farmer had great barns, but he needed to pull those barns down and put up even bigger barns because the harvest was so great. But in this life, he never ever dealt with his eternal soul and where his eternal soul would end up. And so you remember what happened the, that very day his life was required of him and, and what was God's commentary on that life? Fool. What does it profit a man if he should gain the entire world and lose his soul? That our physical life is just a vapor and then it's gone and then there is eternity and we use this life to determine where our eternal soul is going to reside. And so Jesus is really focusing on everybody's attention, on their own determination of where their soul is going to be. Now, as Jesus is headed towards the cross, as his time is running out, the sand is slipping through the hourglass of of his ministry, the nation has rejected him as the Messiah, as the Savior. And so now what we're seeing is Jesus is focusing his invitation of the kingdom of God, not at a national level, but now on an individual basis. That every single person, you need to decide for yourself, uh, who do you say that I am? And so he also, as the nation has rejected him, we see that Jesus now has stopped talking about the kingdom of God is starting more and more to talk about his second coming. And we're starting to see the parables now about a master who goes away and then comes back again. And so these are all the parables of the stories of between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. How should we live our lives? And you remember that last time we looked at that parable of the good steward to who when the master returned uh, how he was ready for him in the second watch or the third watch of the night was ready to attend and so Jesus now more and more focusing on that we see that last time we ended on verse 40 where it said therefore you also be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect him now he is the son of man and what is he talking about his second coming and so so we have all of the prophecies of Christ's first coming, but we have also have all of the prophecies of his second coming. And so here Jesus is talking to the church age. He's talking to us who are between the first and the second coming. And he's telling us to be ready because no man knows the day or the hour. 
God wanted us to be in a constant state of readiness. And I, I wondered about that. What, what would happen, you know, with, with our own propensity towards procrastination? Anybody procrastinate here on anything ever in your entire life? <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, sometimes we can have that tendency of not getting stuff done until there's a deadline or until it, it has to be done. We kind of see it looming. So what would we live, how would we live our lives if the Lord told us that he's not going to come back until June 15th of this next summer. So between now and then, how would we live our lives? We'd be like, oh, he's not coming until June. You know, it's still fall, it's still winter, it's still springtime, you know. And, and with our tendency towards that procrastination, I know that my wife knows me very well. And so one of the things that she always does, when she ever goes away on the weekend to conferences, pastors, wise retreat, and all, then it's just me and the boys uh, at home for the weekend. And so what she will always do is on the day that she is returning, we'll suddenly get a phone call. I'm in Baker, <laughs> which is code for, you have 90 minutes to get that house cleaned uh, uh, up and have it look through. Because the way that she's afraid that the house looks uh, is the way that it looks. Uh, and so we really do have 90 minutes to get everything clean. She walks through the door, everything's nice, it's all good, and we got it all done on time. And so there'd be that tendency see possibly in our lives if the Lord was saying, hey, I'm in Baker, you know, that, uh, that suddenly now we would, you know, get our lives straightened out right then. But, but God doesn't want us to defer that. Why? Because our quality of life is contingent upon the proximity that we live to him. Amen. Right? So it's in our own best interest to draw near to him and not just see salvation as something that starts in eternity, but that salvation begins a quality of life right here, right now, which is so much richer than the quality of life of an unsaved person. When we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit operating in us and we can draw near and have direct access to God now in his presence, is the fullness of joy. And so God doesn't want us to, to live separated from him or distanced from him because that hurts us. The quality of our life is, is inferior. And so we see no man knows the day or the hour. The Lord wants us to keep focused on the spiritual and keep the spiritual focused above uh, the temporal existence uh, that we have. And so we see that the Son of Man is coming at a, at a time that we do not expect. So Jesus has just given the parable now of that expectant steward here. And in verse 41, we're going to see that Peter has a question. He wants to know whether or not that parable of the expectant steward, was that just for us disciples, just for the 12 of us? Because it was about a master going away and then coming back to the servants of that household. Now, remember the disciples, the 12 of them, they traveled wherever Jesus was and, and they were with them at all times. And so was Jesus talking about the, the 12 of them or was there a broader application? Was he talking to the crowds as well or even beyond that? And so the Lord is going to answer that question for us. Verse 41, then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? Now, notice how Peter is referring to him as Lord here. Remember, Jesus asked the question when he was up in Caesarea Philippi, who do the people say that I am? And then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter was the one that said, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And so he declared Jesus as the Messiah. And Jesus said, you are right. You have answered that correctly, but flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. My father who is in heaven has revealed that to you. And here we see now Peter referring to Jesus as Lord. He says, Lord, was that parable just for us or was there a broader application of that parable? And so verse 42, and the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? So Jesus says, that's a good question. Let's, let's examine that. Who is that faithful steward that I was talking about? He said, blessed is that servant 
whom his master will find so doing when he comes. And truly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. And so the faithful steward that the Lord is picturing in this parable is the genuine believer, the person who manages well the the spiritual riches that the Lord has entrusted us with here in this life. And, And so it says that he will make him ruler over all that he has. We will rule and reign in righteousness with Christ in the millennial reign. And so we will participate in the governance of the world when the Lord returns. And so those who are saved are rewarded. And the rewards that we receive from God are going to vary from person to person based upon the amount of sacrifice and service that we have given to the Lord. You remember that the Bema Seat of Judgment is where we will stand before the Lord and we will receive now uh, our rewards for the work that we have done here upon this earth. And then we will take the, those crowns that the Lord gives us and we will cast them at his feet to, and all worship and honor and glory will go to him. But, he says, verse 45, if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, and the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware, and he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And so here we see that Jesus gives a rather graphic illustration of what is going to happen to those uh, who are not responding to the will of the father. So that master, when he returns and he finds the servant, has not been obedient to his wishes. It says, what does he do? He takes him and chops them in half with the sword. Now, that is graphic imagery. And Jesus knew that it was graphic imagery. And he was doing it for a reason. He wanted to get their attention. And guess what? He wants to get our attention as well. And what is the point? What is he saying by taking and chopping a, a, a servant in half with the sword? What he is saying here is that he will utterly destroy him. And this speaks of the final judgment of unbelievers as they stand before the great white throne of judgment. You see, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a mighty God. And when a person stands to give account before them, before God, for their sin, there will be no answer. God wills, listen to this, that none should perish and that all would come to everlasting life. That's God's desire for your life. But if you reject his offer of salvation, then you will be eternally separated from him. And that happens at the great white throne of judgment where people will then be cast into hell. Hell is not a popular word nowadays. It is seldom spoken of in the media or in the world. Most people would like to believe that it doesn't even exist. Many churches have stopped preaching on hell, but Jesus doesn't back down from it at all. Why? Because he is warning people of the reality of it and that God's desire is that no one would choose to ignore the offer of salvation and end up eternally separated. But being chopped in half is nothing compared to what happens in hell where a person is eternally separated. Remember Jesus said, don't fear the person that can only end your physical life. Fear the one who can send you into eternal separation from God. And so here again, what is God's desire? God's desire is that you would do his will and his will is that you would receive the gift of salvation that he has given to each and everyone. And if I don't receive that, Jesus is saying, then you're on your own and destruction will certainly follow. Anybody who rejects truth is always going to experience destruction. That is the consequence of the rejection of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when we reject the truth, then what is the consequence of rejecting truth is always going to be destruction. And so Jesus, verse 47, continues, and that servant who knew his master's will 
knew that mm, God's desire is that you would be saved, that you would receive mm, Christ uh, here, and did not prepare himself or do according to his will, didn't receive him, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. So here again, what do we have? We have uh, the reality that we are responsible for abiding for living our lives according to the truth that has been received into our life. Every single person is exposed to truth in this life. And God expects that you will take that truth and that you will embrace that truth, you will receive that truth, and then you will navigate your life according to that truth. And every single person is gonna stand before God and give an answer for the amount of light that they had, the amount of truth that they had in their life, and what they did with that truth. Now, on the scale of light or truth in a person's life, there is the least amount of light that a person can possibly have, and there goes the scale goes all the way to the fullness of light, to the fullness of truth that a person can experience. So, on the one scale, you've got the pygmy uh, that has never heard of anybody, lives on an island, you know, shipwreck, doesn't know anybody or anything. I mean, that's the that's the the the, the, the uh, the example that the world will give to you, that person that's never heard and they're you know, isolated. So what's the least amount of light that that person is going to be judged by? Well, the book of Romans and tells us in chapter one uh, that nature itself declares the glory of God. For since the creation of the world, verse one, chapter one, verse 20, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The least amount of light that every single person that God created on this earth, the least amount of light that every single person has received is nature and conscience. Nature declares the glory of God. When a person looks up and sees the expanse of the stars in the sky, when the thunder and lightning and the wind and the storms, they realize I am not the biggest and most powerful force in existence. And where did all of this come from? Secondly, God has given to every single person a conscience, your moral compass of right and wrong, and God internally working inside of every single person, convicting you of unrighteousness and leading you into righteousness. There are some people that take their conscience and then navigate according to their conscience. And there's other people that throw their conscience right out the window and do whatever they want in their life. That's the least amount of light that a person is given. And so, whether or not they rejected the light and the truth that they had in their life, or whether they received that light and then navigated according to that light, that is what a person is going to be judged by. So you have the least amount of light, someone who only has conscience in nature, all the way to the other extreme. What is the fullness of light? Jesus said, I am the what? I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. The fullness of revelation of light is Jesus Christ. So when a person rejects Jesus Christ, they have rejected the full expression of the truth of God. And so when you reject God, when you reject truth, when you reject light, then you are going to be judged according to that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no man that comes to the Father except through me. He is offering a new covenant of grace in his blood, whereby all of mankind is going to be rescued from their sin, washed in his shed blood. Now that's the fullness of the knowledge of God's redemptive plan. When a person has experienced the fullness of that, and they reject Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, then ultimately what happens is destruction. Jesus says that they will be cut in half. They will be cast into outer darkness, into the lake of fire. Hell, what is hell? Hell is the absence of God. That's what hell is. Hell is the absence. It is the, the place for the soul where the presence of God is completely absent. Now, God is love. That's what God is. And so hell is a place 
where there is zero love, where there is no love whatsoever. Sometimes it's described as outer darkness, a place of, of cold where love is warm and the absence of love would be cold. It's also called you know, darkness, absence of light and darkness. Others, it talks about the, the torment of a soul without love. So you know, a fire or torment, but all of these expressions now, they just talk about the reality of a soul separated from love. And God is pure, perfect love. And his desire is that we would be connected to him and that we would spend eternity. But these truths are being laid out. Jesus declares, I've come down from heaven. No one reveals the Father except he who came down from heaven and I'm ascending back into heaven again. I have power and authority over life and death. I will go into that grave three days later. I will rise back up to show you that I've got power and authority over the grave as well. And the issue then becomes, what do you believe? Do you believe that or do you not believe that? Jesus says, if you will not confess me before men, if you don't believe that, then when you stand before God, I will not claim you to be my own also. And what will happen? Eternal separation. Now, the nation had rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and now it's on an individual basis. Who do you say that I am? And so Jesus is warning in absolute terms so that when a person stands before God, they cannot say, you know, you never told me. I didn't, I didn't know. Why didn't someone tell me? He said, I absolutely sent my son to reveal the entire plan of redemption. I gave you free will to make your choice. Do you want to spend eternity with me? Or do you want to spend eternity separated from me? God doesn't send anybody to hell. In fact, if you want to go to hell, you have to fight your way all the way into hell because God is going to hound you your entire life through the conviction of the Holy Spirit to try and turn you around and receive salvation, receive salvation, receive salvation, receive salvation. And that's the only way. God wills that none and should perish. The Holy Spirit is called the hound of heaven that chases down and, and runs down uh, everybody. I remember a friend of mine that said when he got saved, he said, yeah, God and I, we work together on my salvation. I said, you work together on your salvation? He says, yes. He says, I did my part. God did his part. I said, you did your part? He said, yes. I ran away from God and then he chased after me uh, and, and he got me. He caught me. <laughs> he said, that's, that's my part. The hound of heaven is chasing down every single soul that is deceived and separated from him and is seeking that fulfillment or gratification lies in a life lived separated from God. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. It's as old as, as Adam and Eve. When, uh, when Satan told Adam and Eve that evil was good and good was evil and that you've got it all backwards and, and don't trust God, don't believe in God. Seek for yourself, get for yourself, and go live the gusto and God's holding out on you. It's the same lie that, that is perpetrated upon our culture and the world today. But Jesus came to cut through all of that. He came to declare to you the absolute truth. And then the Holy Spirit that is inside of you is convicting you of that truth, pressing that truth into your life that this is, in fact, the truth. And every person is responsible for receiving truth. When you hear truth, allowing that to penetrate in your soul, allowing it to penetrate into your life, and then navigating according to that truth that you have received. And so verse 49 we see that Jesus says that, or, or verse 48 continues, for everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. You remember that Peter said, who, who are you talking to, to us or, or to others? And in this sense here, we see that Jesus uh, is answering Peter that, that those apostles would be held more responsible for their actions. Why? Because they had been in the very presence of truth. They had the most amount of truth of anybody on the face of the earth because not only had they met Jesus and spent time with them, but they were in ministry together with them during his earthly ministry. Jesus would explain the parables. He would give them the deeper insights. He poured more truth into them. And so there was a 
an accountability now for them to navigate according to that truth that they had received. And so here we see it's true for them. It is also true for us. As you continue to get to know God, as God continues to reveal himself to you, as he empowers you by his spirit to walk in a manner that is worthy now of your calling, to take truth and not just let it sit on the exterior of your heart, but to embrace it in and then use that truth in your life in order to be able to be fashioned and formed as an instrument worthy to bring glory and honor to the one who created you for that exact purpose in your life. And so Jesus says in verse 49, I came to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit that is going to take place after he has departed, after his ascension. He says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with in how distressed I am till it is accomplished. The baptism that he's talking about is that baptism of suffering, the agony of taking the sins of the world upon himself and then bringing those sins to the cross and paying the penalty for your sins and for my sins. And he says uh, here, how distressed I am till it is accomplished. The Bible says that for the joy that was set before him, that he endured the cross and you and I were the joy that was set before him. And so he came to set men free of the power of sin and death in people's lives. And so in his earthly ministry, he was touching individual people, but now the salvation of mankind, this is what he came to die for and, and, and how heavy, how distressed that he was until that was accomplished. As Jesus keeps moving closer and closer to that cross, as he now is living in the shadow of it and, and facing it down, we see how he is pressing that truth further and further and more aggressively into the hearts and lives of everybody. He wants full disclosure. Why? So that you and I would know the reality of heaven and hell and make that choice uh, to receive Jesus Christ uh, as our Savior. He says in verse 50, how distressed I am till it is accomplished. And, and that is similar to maybe the distress that a, a, that a woman feels in the final month of her pregnancy. When here she is travailing, she's distressed, she is uncomfortable in carrying this child, but she carries it with that joy and hope of seeing its face and being able to, to hold her child and the, the birth and the new life that is going to take place afterwards. Jesus knows that on the other side of the cross, the freedom that awaits for all of humanity. But here he was still approaching the cross and he still would take the sins of mankind upon himself and experience that agony, that tearing away of the fellowship that Christ had experienced, the second person in the Trinity, that intimacy and fellowship with God that before even time was. And now experiencing that tearing, the disfellowship that happens when sin separates us from a holy and righteous God. But Christ, for the great love of us and our redemption, it says that he travailed and how he wished, couldn't wait for it to be accomplished. He says in verse 51, do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you not at all, but rather division. Isn't that a shocking statement? Because at Christmas time, you know, we have the baby in the manger, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Jesus says, do you think that I came to bring peace? Jesus did not come to bring peace in the first coming, in the incarnation. Christ came to open up the kingdom of heaven and to invite everybody in. And that invitation was going to separate the entire world into two camps. Those people that have received and responded to that and those people that have rejected it. It was true back in Jesus's day and it's true all the way till today. Who do you say that I am? And so the world, who does the world say that Jesus is? As a historical figure, even the world cannot deny that Jesus Christ walked the face of the earth. But who does the world say that Jesus is? He was a great teacher. He was a great moralist. He was a great example. Some would even say, oh, possibly that, that he was a prophet to show us a more enlightened path to walk on. 
But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, yeah, I'm a good example. Come follow me. He said, I am the only avenue to your redemption. I was sent here to rescue you from the eternal problem that you've got. And that problem you have is sin. And I am the only one that can help you. That's who Jesus declared himself to be. And so each and every soul now has to wrestle with that truth and either receive it or reject it. And their eternal destination is going to be determined based upon how they answer that question. As the cross is coming forwards, as time is running out, Jesus is not pulling any punches now. The doors are open, yes. The invitation is given, yes. But there are grave consequences if you do not accept that invitation. And more and more we're going to see as Jesus heads into the final week of his life, as he will talk about the, the wedding feast and, and the invitation has gone out, but those who will not come. And we're going to see more and more of him talking about the rejection and the consequences of rejection. Why? Because our God is full disclosure. He's full disclosure. He loves you. He created you. He wants a relationship with you. This is the reality and this is your choice. Uh, and once again, he's not going to force himself on anybody. He's not going to push himself uh, anywhere that he's not wanted. But instead, he is going to give us the free will to choose 100% whether or not we believe what Christ told us and whether or not we wanted to be eternally connected to him. And so here we see that Jesus now is going to talk about the division that takes place. Now, when is the unity going to take place? The unity is going to take place in the millennial reign of Christ. This is now when Christ is going to reign for a thousand years over the earth. This is now when the lion will lie down with the lamb. This is when the implements of war will be beaten into pruner's hooks and into farming equipment. This is when the, the child can play with the adder, with the poisonous snake, and there will be no threat. There will be no danger when humanity will live governed underneath in Christ the way that it was intended to, to be. But that is not this day right now. The day that we are living in is the distance between his first coming and his second coming. The first coming, he came to give the invitation and to open up the kingdom. At the second coming, he will come in judgment at the end of the tribulation, and he will then usher in the millennial reign of Christ. And so... Here he goes on to talk about this division that his invitation to the kingdom causes. He says in verse 52, for from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Sometimes when you accept Jesus Christ, it actually brings division into your family. Sometimes there are non-believers and believers in a, a family together and the acceptance of Christ causes this division. It is interesting if that is what you are experiencing in your life. I want you to be comforted with this. Know that Jesus experienced that, listen to this, in his own family. His own brothers did not believe that he was the Messiah. His own family, you remember his mother and brothers, come to him because they think he's starting to get a little bit out there with the things that he is saying. His own family didn't believe that he was the Messiah until after the resurrection. And so know that that division that you are experiencing, Jesus experienced that with his own half-brothers, his own family. He says, father will be divided against son, verse 53, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Can you imagine what Thanksgiving looks like in this household? <laughs> But it is the reality that some people do experience even in their Thanksgiving meal. And so Jesus said, no, I am not going to unite the world. I'm going to separate the world. And there will be a division around me. And then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say a shower is coming. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say there will be hot weather. And there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern the time? 
Jesus is saying that you know how to look. Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morning, sailors take warning. You know how to read the signs in the physical environment and know what is going to happen in the future based upon what you are seeing. He says, how is it that you do not have that same ability in the spiritual realm? You see, God gave this prophetic word. And in the prophetic word, he has declared the things that will absolutely be. God gave us the word so that we would know that he is God and that there is no other God. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, it says that you might know that I am the true and the living God and there is no other God. He says, I will tell you the end from the beginning. He knew that there would be false religions. He knew that there would be duplicates and copycats, but there is always a way to tell the authentic from that which is false. And God said, I placed in my word, in my holy word, I placed the prophetic word that will declare to you the history of mankind from beginning to end. Why? So that you might know that I am the one that stands outside of time and that I am the creator over all of it. And nobody else would dare to put those things in. We have the prophetic word of the history of the world, of the nations that would rise, the empires, who would come after who, out of what countries they would come from. And we have seen the fulfillment of those nations, of the empires, from the Babylonians to the Persians to the Medo-Persians. We have seen the Grecian Empire and the Roman Empire, all of these and predicted ahead of time down to the finest details. We have the prophecies of Christ's first coming and second coming, that he would be born of a virgin and born in Bethlehem, that he would be crucified on a tree, that he'd be crucified between two thieves, and on and on and on and on and on it goes down the minutest of details. But Jesus holds them accountable for not knowing the time that they were living in. Because you see, God had given them the time. In the book of Daniel, it was recorded the weeks and prophecy. God told Daniel to write this down. There would be 70 sets of seven, 490 years in the history of the nation of Israel, that after 483 years, the, that there would be now the 69 years minus one final seven-year period. That final seven-year period is reserved. That's the tribulation period. It says that from the going forth of the command of Artaxerxes to rebuild the nation, 483 years forward from that day, the Messiah, the prince, will be cut off from the nation. In other words, Messiah will make his appearance at the nation in this period of time. Well, there was a head detective of Scotland Yard named Sir Robert Anderson in 1895. He took that prophecy that is found in Daniel and he did the calculations out the 483 years measured from the time that Artaxerxes gave that command. Remember that the nation was brought into Babylon, into captivity. And then Artaxerxes is the one that sent them to go back. Zerubbabel led the first wave, then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. Well, they have the date of Artaxerxes' edict and command for them to go back to their nation and to rebuild it after they had been taken into captivity. And if you take that date uh, that is known and you go forwards 483 years, exactly as Daniel said, you come to the day that Jesus makes his triumphal entry into the nation of Israel. He says, you know how to look at the weather and determine the future, and yet you have the word of God that has told you what is going to happen, and yet you reject it. You do not know the time that you are living. He held them accountable for knowing the truth that had been given to them. And God also now has given to us the prophecies of the second coming. And so we stand in the same period of time of expectancy, of waiting. 
and we have all of the nations that are going to be gathered together, that there is going to be a one world government that is going to uh, form, that there is going to be a mark of the beast, a technology that will be able to track everybody in the world, an economic system that will be so sophisticated that every single person in the entire world will be tied into this and chip into this mark, that technology is going to absolutely explode, that love is going to decrease, that famines and pestilence and earthquakes and, and the earth itself is going to begin to tremble, that there will be discord and the natural affection of families will begin to break down, that divorce will become rampant and the people will be steeped into a love of self, into a, a, a love of money. All of the predictions talking about now when the Lord is going to return a second time. But all of that begins again when the prophetic timepiece clicks because the nation of Israel was gone from its land. And when the Lord returns a second time, he's going to return back to the nation of Israel, but there was no nation of Israel until 1948. When in the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy, God said that I will do what's never been done on the history of mankind. I will bring a nation that is extinct. I will bring them back together again and reformulate them. And I will stitch them together and make of them a nation in their own land once again. And in 1948, God did exactly what he said that he was going to do. And the prophetic timepiece clicked on again. And we are now moving in those very days down to the very last days before the Lord's return. Exactly as God said. Jesus held them accountable for not knowing the time that they were living in. And it's important for us to, to know the times that we are living in here as well. In verse 57, we see that, that now Jesus says, and yes, and why even of yourselves do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid the very last might. What's Jesus talking about? He says that when you are with an adversary and you're going to go to the judge, he says, along the way, you have time to be able to work that out, to be able to resolve your conflict before you get to that judge. But once you get to the judge and the judge takes that case, guess what? You just lost the ability to resolve that conflict. It's now in the hands of the judge. And when a judge judges, hey, you are going to have to do exactly down to the last and might what the judge has decreed. And so he is saying the exact same thing. You are going to stand before the judge. You have the opportunity right now to be able to resolve the conflict that you have with God, the sin issue that you have in your life. And before you get into the judge, use that time to receive the gift of salvation, the forgiveness of your debt, the forgiveness of your sins, so that when you stand before God, you stand before him forgiven. Because if you do not, then you will be judged by righteousness. And by the righteous standard of God, you will be found guilty. And there will be no mercy and there will be no grace at that time. That is a time for the righteousness of God's judgment to take place. Now is the time of mercy. Now is the time of grace. Now is the time to deal with that issue, not when you're standing at the great white throne of judgment. Because if you end up standing there, it is too late, and you are now in the hands of a righteous judge who will execute righteousness down to the last might. As we close our study here, I want to draw our attention for just a moment back to verse 49, back to where Jesus says that I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. The fire that Jesus is talking about is the fire of the Holy Spirit. And that fire comes down on the day of Pentecost when Jesus now has sent his disciples to Jerusalem and told them to wait now for the dunamis, for the power to come along, the helper that he was going to send. Now, the 
Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the new covenant, we're in the new covenant, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit is a threefold ministry. And I just wanted to take a moment to just break that down so that everybody has got clarity on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's found in the prepositions. There's three different prepositions that we find in the New Testament uh, dealing with the Holy Spirit and mankind. The prepositions are with and in and upon. And so those are the three different functions of the Holy Spirit in the world today. Now, first is the with. The word in Greek is para, P-A-R-A. It's where we get our word parallel, which means to take a line and put another one alongside of it. So para means alongside of. The Holy Spirit is here in the earth and has come alongside of each and every one of us. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the non-believer's life, he is along side is to convict them of unrighteousness, to point them to salvation in Christ Jesus and to bring conviction in their life uh, of their sin. And so that is the para, that is the alongside of convicting people so that they receive Christ, pointing everybody to Christ. That is the alongside. Now, when a person accepts Jesus Christ, as your personal Lord and Savior, and invites uh, the Lord into their heart, the Holy Spirit now comes into a person's heart. And so that is the in of the Holy Spirit. As a believer, each and every one of us have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. A non-believer only has the Holy Spirit on the outside alongside trying to convict them that they need to receive their salvation and the interior dwelling of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, know you not that you are the temple of the living God. You have the Holy Spirit that resides inside of you. When the Holy Spirit now resides inside of you, you have the power of God working in your life. And he begins to change you from the inside out, molding you, fashioning you, changing you, purifying, cleansing, and and doing that incredible work of now molding you into the image and likeness of Christ. That's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the operation of a believer. But there is now a third a relationship to the Holy Spirit, and that is an upon experience when the Holy Spirit comes upon or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the disciples, when did they get saved? They got saved actually not on the day of Pentecost. Many people get that wrong. They got saved in John's gospel, chapter 20, when Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. This is now when they had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So they are saved at that point. But they notice that they are still timid. They're afraid that they're going to get arrested. They're waiting there in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit that Jesus says will come in great power when I send the Holy Spirit upon you. And so it is there at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And so, or overflowing them is another uh, translation for that same preposition. That's the epi experience. And so you have the para, the n, which is in, and then you have the epi, the Holy Spirit comes upon. It was the Holy Spirit came upon them and clothes of fire dwelt over their head. The epi or the baptism of the Holy Spirit is about the outflow of the Holy Spirit from a person's life onto others. The indwelling is about your personal sanctification. The outflow is your kingdom purpose empowerment to be able to affect others. We see that after the Holy Spirit came upon them, what happens? Peter preaches a a message and 3,000 thousand people get saved. There is a, this outflow now of the Spirit. You remember that Jesus said that, uh, that out of your heart that streams of living water will flow outward. So the indwelling is about your personal sanctification, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, is a separate uh, uh, encounter with uh, God and with the Holy Spirit. It can happen at salvation, 
They can happen both at the same time. A person can get baptized in the Spirit when they are saved. We see an example of that in Cornelius, the centurion in Caesarea, when Peter comes from Joppa and preaches the gospel, and they get saved. They start speaking in tongues. The baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, comes forth, but it can also be a subsequent experience as we saw with the Samaritans as well. They got saved, but it wasn't until Peter comes and prays that there was the epi, there was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that fell upon them. And so we have the the Holy Spirit, the fire of God. He's alongside of the non-believer. He's indwelling in the new believer. And for those who ask, that's all you have to do is ask God If you want that baptism of the Holy Spirit, you just need to ask God. And that asking is about an empowerment of the Holy Spirit to flow out of you for kingdom building and to transform the the environment that is around you. And all you need to do is, is to ask. The Bible says that God knows how to give good gifts to his children who ask. And you don't need to be afraid about that that epi experience, that baptism of the Holy Spirit. You just have to desire to draw nearer to God and to be used more fully by him here in this life. And so I want to encourage everybody into the ministry of the Holy Spirit who is alive and powerful and is at work in the church in the world, and in the hearts uh, of believers. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Father, I pray that you would help us to discern the times that we are living in. That, Lord, that we would recognize that, that drawing near to you is, is your will for our life. And, and, Lord, that we would be drawn by your matchless grace your beauty and your mercy. I pray for anybody who has never received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior that they wouldn't wait one more day, but today would be that day. And I pray for every heart that's stirred, that's interested in that epi experience, that baptism of the Spirit, that, Lord, that you would draw them to to come close to you and to ask for that upon experience of the Holy Spirit. Father, help us to continue to walk without fear, without worry, without anxiety, trusting in you in all things, and help us to keep you first and foremost in our life. God, bless us now and fill us afresh. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. All right, next week we're actually going to get to Luke 13.